Now it's time for the last word. Yeah. Lawrence O'Donnell. Lawrence is back. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Rachel. You, you sure you don't want to keep going? Because I still have a bit of a cold that kept me <laughs> out for the last couple of nights. And if you have any more energy, you'd like to just keep. This going. is one of those. I'm, I'm this was one of those that. nights for me where I went. I sat down to go to the makeup room, and Corey, my executive producer, came down. And he was like, "Okay, so we're about 35 minutes heavy for the show." Mm. In a one-hour show, as you know, that's a little bit catastrophic. So if you want me to sit here because you're worried about your cold, you, I got plenty to go. You guys should have consulted with me on that. <laughs> 35 minutes sounds great to me tonight. Are it you really feeling, does. Are you feeling better? I'm, I'm sort of back. Uh, yeah. We'll see if the cold pill works for the whole hour. We'll see how this works. Well, you look great. We missed you. Thank you, Rachel. All right. Thanks, Lars. Thank you. Well, new reporting tonight by The Washington Post says that the president of the United States and the Saudi royal family are not searching for the truth of what happened to Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. They are searching for a mutually agreeable explanation. That's their phrase. And it's not easy to find an explanation for why Jamal Khashoggi was seen entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul and was never seen leaving that Saudi consulate. In fact, it's not easy to answer a single question about it if what you're really trying to do is get to an agreeable explanation. Did they say that uh, Mr. Khashoggi is alive or dead? I don't want to talk about any of the facts. Uh, they, they didn't want to either, in that they want to have the opportunity to complete this investigation in a thorough way. Did you talk about repercussions in case the Saudis are, are funds being involved? We, we talked about the importance of completing the investigation. That is the sound of someone who's looking for an agreeable explanation, not someone who's looking for the truth. The Washington Post is reporting tonight, the Trump administration and the Saudi royal family are searching for a mutually agreeable explanation for the death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, one that will avoid implicating Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is among the president's closest foreign allies, according to analysts and officials in multiple countries. Also tonight, the Washington Post published the final op-ed piece by Jamal Khashoggi, which was delivered to the paper by Khashoggi's translator the day after he disappeared. In the piece, Khashoggi says, Arab governments have been given free reign to continue silencing the media at an increasing rate. The Arab world is facing its own version of an iron curtain. And today, the New York Times added more gruesome detail to what happened to Jamal Khashoggi inside the Saudi consulate. The Times source for this report was an unnamed Turkish official who described an audio recording that allegedly recorded the sound of the murder and the dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi. The Times report quotes, after, says, after he was shown into the office of the Saudi consul, the agents seized Mr. Khashoggi almost immediately and began to beat and torture him, eventually cutting off his fingers. The Saudi consul then said, quote, do this outside, you will put me in trouble. One of the killers replied, quote, if you want to live when you come back to Arabia, shut up. And then the New York Times reporting turns much more gruesome, quote, as they cut off Mr. Khashoggi's head and dismembered his body, a doctor of forensics who had been brought along for the, the dissection and disposal had some advice for the others. According to the senior Turkish official, listen to music, he told them, as he put on headphones himself. That was what he did to ease the tension when doing such work, the official said. Here's what the president said today about the audio recording of the murder. Have you asked for this audio, video uh, intelligence at the church? We have asked for it if it exists. We have, have asked for it. Yeah. But you haven't gotten We've asked for it if it exists. Are you surprised that they haven't turned it over? No. Uh, I'm not sure yet that it exists. Probably does. Possibly does. Tonight, The Washington Post is reporting U.S. intelligence officials said they had no reason to doubt that Turkey has an audio recording that shows what officials claim. The Post is also reporting that the chairman of the Foreign Relations, Senate Foreign Relations Committee Republican Senator Bob Corker is saying that the Trump administration had clamped down on sharing intelligence about the Khashoggi case. He said an intelligence briefing scheduled for Tuesday was canceled and he was told no additional intelligence would be shared with the Senate for now, a move he called disappointing. Bob Corker told The Washington Post, quote, I can only surmise that probably the intel is not painting a pretty picture 
as it relates to Saudi Arabia. Leading off our discussion now, Tim O'Brien, the executive editor of Bloomberg Opinion and the author of Trump Nation, The Art of Being the Donald. Also joining us is Richard Stengel, former Under Secretary of State, and Evelyn Farkas, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. All are MSNBC contributors. And Evelyn, let me start with you. Uh, it, it seems to me as I listen to this administration, especially as I listen to the president, that the choice seems to be that either Donald Trump doesn't care about Saudis possibly murdering a journalist, or Donald Trump actually approves of Saudis murdering a journalist. I don't see any other option on what I hear him saying so far. Well, Lawrence, I would say that he probably doesn't approve, because if you remember, when the story first broke, he did tell Leslie Stahl in the 60 Minutes interview that he found it horrendous, and particularly horrendous if it was true, that it was a murder of a journalist, right? So I don't think he approves, but I think you're onto something when you say he doesn't care. Because if he cared, he would understand very clearly the implications of this on a human level, certainly. I mean, we're talking about somebody who lived here as a permanent resident, who was a colleague of, of, of people that you and I know in Washington, D.C., and, of course, has family here living in the United States as well. I'm not sure if they're citizens or not, but I also think that's not relevant, although the president has made a bit of a beef about it. The, but I think the main point is that this president, you know, pulling back, he's the president. So regardless of whether he understands it as a human, we're talking about U.S. interests and leadership inside America. So, you know, the audience is, is the American people, first and foremost, and then the world. And he doesn't understand that values have a value for the United States when we are essentially going out in the world conducting foreign policy. So it's not just money and arms sales and economic interests, military interests, but the values that America espouses, standing up for human rights. And in this case, something that was done so blatantly in our face, as Lindsey Graham said, you know, and then the lies that came afterwards. We as a country need to stand up for the international community and stand up for these principles, for all the other people who are trying to speak out, all the journalists who are trying to do the right thing, all the dissidents around the world, and to really stiffen the spines of other Democrats and other countries and other leaders around the world, because that's what the United States does. Rick Stengel, uh, you worked in the State Department with Secretary of State John Kerry. Would he today have been saying, um, we didn't ask them any facts, <laughs> we don't want to know any facts, we don't want to know any answers? Uh, what would we be hearing from the Secretary of State in the previous administration? You get a very stern warning to the Saudis about this. Uh, we would be looking at all of the ranges of things that could have an effect on them, from arms control agreements, You'd be looking at something called the Global Magnitsky Act, which allows the President of the United States to sanction international human rights violators. Uh, the same way that we sanctioned the oligarchs in Russia, you'd be looking at the sanctioning of, of the princes and the royal family in Saudi Arabia. One of the things that's disturbing about the way that Don Donald Trump has reacted to this, and Saudi Arabia has been our ally since FDR met with King Saud in 1948. But we always tried to get them to move toward a more progressive direction. Even when we were selling arms to them, we'd say, you can't use it on your own people. You can't take the technology that we give you and use it on your own people. The Trump administration has a complete hands-off transactional approach. They say, here are the weapons, here's the technology, use them as you like. That's what's disturbing, and I agree with Evelyn, that we need to kind of talk about human rights when we're dealing with our allies and our adversaries. Uh, Tim, uh, your headline today on your reporting in uh, Bloomberg is, Trump and Kushner put Saudis' money first. How much uh, does that explain what we're seeing? I think it, explain, it explains a lot of it. You know, this is <clears throat> uh, freelancing on foreign policy coming home to roost. You cannot run a sophisticated foreign policy in the, in the Middle East on the heels of Jared Kushner, who, through most of the period that he's been operating over there, he didn't have a full security clearance. He had very little diplomatic experience. But what he did have was a failing skyscraper on Fifth Avenue that his family was desperately trying to refinance. He had lobbied the Chinese for an investment during uh, uh, both uh, the campaign and the transition period. He may have spoken to Russians. We still don't really, he denies it, but there's still some question about that. And we know that he spoke to at least one Saudi investor. And the president essentially let him 
lead this tilt towards Saudi Arabia in a real or in a real politic sense. It's a bulwark against Iran. In terms of the Trump family's own finances, the Kushners and the Trumps, I think they saw it as a pure business opportunity. And everything that the president has said when he's pressed to explain why he doesn't want to just cleanly and clearly condemn the apparent murder of Khashoggi is he says that Saudi Arabia invests a lot of money in the United States and we have a big arms deal with him. And in fact, he's misrepresented the bona fides of the arms deal. He's, he's overstated how much it's worth and, and when the money is going to arrive. But I think in the back of both of their minds, they see the Saudis as potential business partners. And you know, they've had a completely hands-off approach about the war in Yemen, where American weapons are being used to kill thousands and thousands of civilians. The UN released a report just yesterday that there's a famine among 10 million people in Yemen. So the American weapons that we are selling them, that the taxpayer is supporting, is being used for these basically terrorist purposes that the Trump is, is, is hands off about. And that was something the Obama administration was very concerned about. Evelyn, on the uh uh, on the arms sales, arms sales have been uh, used in a, in a variety of ways by uh, American administrations, including to try to obtain better behavior from the regimes uh, that we have sold arms to. Right. I mean, Lawrence, the, you know, it's one way that we actually have ongoing influence because they need our arms. This is the problem. The president also doesn't understand that the Saudis actually need us at this point more than we need them. We don't rely on them for oil as much as we did in the past. In fact, I think they're the second, they're the, our second importer after Canada, if I'm correct on that. And in the arms deals, you're right. They get, you know, they sign up to buy a bunch of arms and they signed up to $110 billion and under Obama, of course, it was 115, and some of those dollars are actually for the same <laughs> programs. It doesn't matter. They don't spend as much, but what they do spend, we then get to watch. We, ha we make them sign agreements saying that they won't transfer any of the technology. We watch what they're doing. As, as Rich said, you know, we have ongoing hardcore diplomacy with countries that use our weapons to ensure that they don't use them in ways we disagree with, because then we can sanction them and not provide spare parts that they need, not provide provide training and other things that they need. Rick, you've uh, had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Mohammed bin Salman uh, in your last year in, in the State Department, uh, the two of you one-on-one -on -one for uh, a couple of hours late at night. Uh, what, what do you know about him? What, have you, what did you gain about him that could, that could guide the way we watch what we're watching now? Well, the meeting was at midnight, which is an early meeting in Saudi Arabia. They keep you waiting all day long and then meet you at midnight. And he, he's a very powerful, impressive figure. He's physically large. He talked about the openings that he was planning on doing, allowing women to drive, uh, opening movie theaters. He talked about an issue that the U.S. government has been concerned about for decades, which is Saudi Wahhabi schools. They support Wahhabi schools all around the Muslim world. They give Korans to that, and it's a very severe form of Islam that some people think is a, is a, is a reason for extremism. He talked about all those things. He talks a great game. The problem is he feels no impunity to what he can do. He's completely consolidated power. He doesn't report to anybody. and his has an authoritarian tendency that nobody represses, and we've seen what the result of that is. Uh, Tim, the, when Donald Trump said during, uh, has said publicly, uh, you know, uh, the Saudis, they buy a lot of apartments from me. I, of course I like the Saudis. Right. Uh, is that a, pretty much all you have to know about Donald Trump and the Saudis? Uh, no, it's not all you have to know. And in fact, I think it's ironic that he felt un prompted, he had to go on Twitter yesterday and say, I have no investments in Saudi Arabia, parenthetically, or in Russia either. And he's been playing this game for about a year in which he says, I don't have investments in these countries that people are concerned about. The reality is they have investments in him, oftentimes here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we're... Oh, what do you mean by an investment in him? <clears throat> well, they're buying his condominiums. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's, he, he had Russian buyers for scores of his condominiums. He had partners of Russian descent on projects like the Trump mm -hmm. Soho. Uh, the, the Saudi Arabian government bought the entire 45th floor of Trump World Tower in 2001. This goes far back in his history. Even prior to that, um, uh, uh, Al Walid bin Talal bailed Trump out in the early 1990s when he almost went personally bankrupt. When a prominent Saudi sheikh bought his yacht 
and the Plaza Hotel from his banks when he couldn't afford to own them any longer. And I think one of the signals, is, and the Saudi delegation, by the way, is one of the biggest clients of the Trump International Hotel in Washington. And the signal that this is sending to the world is that the president of the United States can be bought and sold. Mm. If you need to curry favor or if you need to be able to run roughshod over your region, as long as you do business with the Trump administration and with the president personally, you can pretty much do whatever you want. I think it's a low point in U.S. foreign policy, and it's really unusual. Evelyn, if this had happened in a previous administration uh, where you didn't have the questions of uh, how much does Donald Trump owe financially to Saudis, uh, how much does the president involve financially with Saudis, uh, and all of that was out of the picture, uh, and we could expect uh, an, an honest attempt by an administration, an American administration, to deal with this, it's still very difficult to deal with, isn't it, given uh, the Saudi geopolitical position with the United States? Yes, I mean, Lawrence, you still have to balance, right, the, the hard national interests with human rights and dealing with this kind of extraterritorial, ter extrajudicial killing. I think this did cross a line, again, as I mentioned, because the killing was conducted in a consulate in Turkey, and then they lied about it. Uh, to the world, to us, you know, it does cross a line, which is not to excuse Yemen or any of the other terrible things they did. And I think, as you said, for any administration, it would be difficult. We have other allies and partners that we deal with. We deal with China, and they also have a bad human rights record, right? But we find a way to express our displeasure, to put pressure at a minimum diplomatic. But in this case, absolutely, it has to be more than that. It has to be economic, because they lied. Uh, frankly speaking, the Saudi kingdom needs to hold people accountable up to the crown prince. I mean, if I were Pompeo, you know, I would have gone in there and given a very strong message from my president. You know, if it were a different president, <laughs> he would have been saying, we need the facts now. First of all, where is this man? Is he alive? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So right now, all Pompeo did was Secretary Pompeo went there and said, well, the fox is investigating what happened in the chicken coop. And then he flew over to Turkey, which is basically the farm where the chicken coop is, and seemed to dismiss. I mean, we haven't heard anything out of him about what he heard in Turkey. And we do know from one of the, I think it was the Washington Post account that Shane Harris wrote, that he didn't want to listen to the tape. I guess I wouldn't want to either. But really, the administration needs to tell the American people and certainly Congress what they know. Evelyn Farkas, Rick Stengel, Tim O'Brien, thank you for starting our discussion tonight. And when we come back, Donald Trump tries to disown Michael Cohen once again after reports indicate Michael Cohen has spent 50 hours with prosecutors discussing the Trump family businesses. And John Heilman will join us with a special report from, North, from the North Dakota Senate race tonight. And later, we'll take a look at Pennsylvania, where Donald Trump won by one percentage point. But now, the Trump candidates in Pennsylvania are in big trouble, including the Trump candidate for Senate, who is trailing by 15 points. Breaking news tonight, NBC News has confirmed that Don McGahn is out as White House counsel. Today was Don McGahn's last day, according to two White House officials. The New York Times, which first reported the news, says Mr. McGahn may have also caused more damage for Mr. Trump than any other White House official in the special counsel investigation. Mr. McGahn has spent at least 30 hours with Mr. Mueller's investigators laying out how Mr. Trump tried to interfere with or quash the inquiry, including by trying to fire Mr. Mueller himself in the summer of 2017. Federal prosecutors met with President Trump's former personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, today at his attorney's office. A person familiar with the matter tells NBC News Michael Cohen met with, quote, a group of state and federal law enforcement officials investigating various aspects of President Donald Trump's family business and charitable organization, according to CNN.com. Yesterday, President Trump was asked about Michael Cohen's plea deal with federal prosecutors for the first time in an interview with the Associated Press. The Associated Press asked the president, quote, Cohen testified under oath in federal court that you directed him to commit a crime. Did you, sir? Trump replied, totally false. It's totally false. The Associated Press followed up with, so he's lying under oath? President Trump replied, oh, absolutely he's lying. And Michael Cohen was a PR person who did small legal work, very small legal work. He represented me very little. It's a very low level. 
In April, when Michael Cohen's home, office, and hotel room were raided by the FBI, President Trump said this. It's a disgrace. It's frankly a real disgrace. It's a, an attack on our country in a true sense. Joining us now, John Heilman, National Affairs Analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. He's co-host and executive producer of Showtime's The Circus. And Mimi Roker is with us, a former federal prosecutor and MSNBC legal contributor. And John, uh, President Trump, in, in accusing Michael Cohen of being a liar, tells the lie that Michael Cohen was just a small player in his operation who had very little to do with Donald Trump. Yes, um, barely knew him. I hard, I hard to imagine that he even has an opinion about Michael Cohen. I'm not sure he's ever heard of the man. He's never had any part of Donald Trump's life whatsoever. The only thing I think that's true, Lawrence, of the things that Donald Trump said about Michael Cohen is that he did very little legal work for Donald Trump because it doesn't seem like he actually did very much legal work for Donald Trump because he's not really a lawyer. He also didn't do much PR work, although he did represent Trump in the press to some extent. What he did for Donald Trump in the period of time, the decade or so that he worked with Donald Trump, not a little bit, but a lot, every day, for many hours every day. And if you ever dealt with Donald Trump in those 10 years or so, you knew that Michael Cohen was the guy you had to talk to to have any kind of interaction with Donald Trump. What he did was not legal work or PR work, but was business development work. He was the guy who made deals for Donald Trump. He was the guy who cleaned up Donald Trump's problems. He was the Ray Donovan guy. He was the guy who went to Moscow and tried to make Trump Tower Moscow happen and to many other countries around the world. So is Trump telling the truth about the fact that Michael Cohen was not much of a lawyer for him? Yes. Was, is Donald Trump telling the truth about anything else related to Michael Cohen's degree of involvement in his life? No, all of that is a grotesque lie. And uh, Vanity Fair is reporting tonight about Michael Cohen. Despite having no formal cooperation agreement with the government, Cohen has willingly assisted and provided information critical to several ongoing investigations, according to two sources familiar with the situation, in a string of meetings that have exceeded more than 50 hours. Uh, Mimi Rocco, what does that tell you? That's a lot of time. Yeah. It tells me he's got a lot of information <laughs> and they are interested in hearing what he has to say. Everyone should understand, though, no one's going to take Michael Cohen's word at face value. They're not going to just write down what he says and then, you know, go in to the grand jury and base charges against anyone or any entity on that alone. They are going to try and corroborate and cross reference and, you know, double check as much as they humanly can. And that is often a lot, particularly when we're talking about uh, information about the Trump organization. You know, it sounds like Cohen is giving information in so many different avenues here. We, we know he's talking to Mueller, or, or that's what's been reported. We know now that he's talking to the Southern District and the New York AG's office. So that is going to dovetail with the tax uh, investigations that we know the New York AG's office is looking at. Clearly, there, the Southern District is uh, you know, expanded beyond just Michael Cohen and is looking more broadly at the Trump organization and its role in uh, these hush money payments and other things like that. So Cohen has so much different information, and John's exactly right. He probably, you know, you don't call him a lawyer, fine. It doesn't matter what you right. call him. You could talk, call him a PR person. You could call him a guy. Right. It really doesn't matter. What matters is what he knows, and that's what's being conveyed now, and that's important. Very, very busy prosecutors have decided to spend 50 hours yeah. with him. He knows something. Uh, Lenny Davis made a, a comment to the Associated Press today, uh, where Cohen, and they reported as Cohen's attorney, Lenny Davis, told USA Today his client had two words for the president's claims on truth versus lies, audio and tape. He said the president <laughs> should be worried. Uh, John Heilman, uh, Lenny yeah. Davis's two words, audio yeah. and tape. Yes, that actually sort of clarifies the point that Mimi was just making, which is it doesn't really matter whether we call him an attorney, a PR person, or a business development person. That what we should really call him is he's the guy who has the goods. And the goods are in the form of audio. And so to Mimi's point, yes, Michael Cohen is also a liar, someone who has lied to many people on many occasions on Donald Trump's behalf. And I'm certain that if he thought he could get away with lying to prosecutors in order to reduce his sentence going forward, he would lie to them too. But he knows two things. One is that 
he, if he gets caught lying to prosecutors, it does him no good. He's trying to stay out of jail. So he has an incentive to tell the truth in this instance. And the second thing he has, as Lanny Davis suggests, is some amount of audio tape. We've heard some of the audio already. Some of it's public. Much more of it is not yet public. And so in the end, the value that Michael Cohen has to bring to prosecutors and the threat that he poses to Donald Trump is the breadth of his knowledge and the ability to back it up, not just with his word, but with hard evidence in the form of audio. Rod Rosenstein, who we all know has been supervising uh, Robert, the, Robert Mueller's investigation, said this today to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reports it as Mr. Rosenstein offered a forceful defense of the inquiry, saying the public would have faith in its findings. At the end of the day, the public will have confidence that the cases we brought were warranted by the evidence and that it was an appropriate use of resources. And Mimi, uh, that is a, a strong expression of confidence by Rod Rosenstein, who knows that these findings will be thrown into uh, a political crossfire. It's also just extraordinary that he did this interview and that he did it now, so close to the election, shortly after the meeting with Trump on the plane that made people sort of question whether he was still operating independently. And I wonder, I mean, we don't know for sure, but I wonder if that's part of why he did this. And, you know, there were some mixed messages, I think, in some of the things Rosenstein said, but I think that that quote that you pointed to really does seem to be saying, look, there's stuff coming down the pike and whatever happens, whatever you might be planning to do, Mr. President, you know, the people are watching and are going to have faith in this investigation. And that's a very strong statement for him to make right now. And John, uh, given Justice Department rules on this, uh, the Republicans can relax, presumably between now and Election Day, uh, that uh, the special prosecutor won't be revealing anything uh, dramatic or serious between now and that time. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and look, we saw some reporting also today, I believe this morning in Bloomberg, uh, that suggested that some sources close to the Mueller inquiry, inquiry were suggesting that, uh, that Mueller was pretty close uh, to rolling out some charges, uh, the kinds of things that, that are kind of hinted at or suggested by uh, the Rosenstein interview right after the election. And, and certainly we've all been waiting for a long time. We've thought that Bob Mueller was more or less done, with the exception of an interview with Trump, that he was more or less done with the obstruction piece of his inquiry. Those charges just may be ready to roll. Um, again, once that negotiation is done with the White House, brought to conclusion one way or the other with Donald Trump. But I think, you know, the, the Republicans can breathe easy between now and November 6th, but we could have a pretty busy time immediately following November 6th uh, before Thanksgiving, even it's possible. Mimi Roca, thank you for joining this discussion tonight. John Hahn is going to stay with us. He's reporting from North Dakota tonight, and he will be back with his report on the North Dakota Senate race with Heidi Heitkamp, Democratic senator, trying to hold on to her seat. He'll join, he'll join us with that report next. Democratic Senator Heidi Heitkamp's re-election campaign in North Dakota has been struggling in the polls since she voted against Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation to the Supreme Court. Now Republican officials in North Dakota are doing everything they can to suppress the votes of Native Americans living on reservations by requiring voter IDs that include specific residential addresses. They know that it is very common for residents of reservations to simply use post office box addresses in all of their identification. The suppression of the tribal vote and Senator Heidkamp's decision to vote against the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh meant that her campaign was going to be in an uphill climb in which they could not afford any mistakes. And then the Heidkamp campaign staff made a serious mistake. The Republican challenger, Congressman Kevin Kramer, criticized the Me Too movement for being about victimization. And as, as the New York Times reports, quote, Invoking his wife, daughters, mother, and mother-in-law, Mr. Kramer said they cannot understand this movement toward victimization. They are pioneers of the prairie. These are tough people whose grandparents were tough and great-grandparents were tough. The Heitkamp campaign took out a newspaper ad as an open letter to Congressman Kramer signed by over 100 women saying, we are all survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, or rape. <clears throat> we are all North Dakotans. We are all prairie tough. The Heitkamp campaign staff failed to check with every woman whose name appeared as a signatory to that letter, and some of the women objected. John Heilman has been reporting in North Dakota this week for his show, The Circus, on Showtime, and he was there when Senator Heidkamp had to apologize. Senator Heidkamp never mentioned that this was a mistake made by her campaign staff. 
This has caused tremendous concern and hurt for a lot of the women who were listed. Um, it's, it's, it's very humbling for me to stand here and say how, as an advocate for victims of violence, that we did something that added to their hurt. This is a bad, bad mistake. We're going to do everything we can to um, uh, take responsibility and to make sure that um, this never happens again, um, but also make sure that we are um, uh, repeatedly saying how sorry we are to the people whose names were on this letter that um, did not authorize their names to be used. So I saw her when she said down there, you seem mm -hmm. emotional. This about, is very, the, about the thing from today. This I mean, is very hard. I mean, my whole life has been protecting victims, and part of that is protecting their anonymity. And to have this happen is unacceptable, and it's, it's wrong. And I think we need to own it. I need to say. I, I think way too often people, people say, well, we're protecting victims, and what does that mean? Well, it means that, that you take ownership when you've done something that hurts victims, and that's what I'm trying to do. And John Holloman is back with us. And John, uh, what I've been struck by in her explanations is that she, as she says, takes ownership of it. Um, this was a staff mistake. I mean, this is not something she did, but she takes ownership of it. How, how is that answer playing with the audience you, sh you saw her deliver it to? Um, I think it played well with that audience, Lawrence. I think she, the way in which she owned it, she took a bad situation. She has no uh, explanation for it. She has no excuse. They've let someone go now from the campaign today. But in that room, uh, for high camp supporters, I think they admire the way in which she was willing to own the mistake uh, and be forthright about it and apologize and just say, look, there's no excuse for this. It's a, a horrible mistake. I think as a political matter, uh, it has left her campaign, which was, as you suggested in your intro, uh, in a difficult place coming out of the Kavanaugh vote anyway, and in the face of these voter suppression efforts, she really was, she started, she was starting to, to, to see some daylight uh, with Kevin Kramer pulling away even before the Kavanaugh vote. The, the margin has widened during the Kavanaugh confirmation controversy. We haven't seen polling since the vote itself, but because of the polling in the state on Kavanaugh, she knew that taking that vote was going to imperil uh, her, her, her career even more than it was already imperiled. She told me in the, in the later in this interview, she said, I knew this was the hill that I was choosing to die on in some ways, that I was, I, I was making a vote that was a very tough vote. It was the, I knew I had to make it, and I knew that it might cost me uh, re-election, and I was still willing to do it. She's spirited, and she's tough, but the circumstances here are very, 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 uh, are, are, are very difficult for her going forward, and this mistake that she made on Monday has not made things any better. You can watch politics a long time and, and not see a senator cast a vote where the senator knowingly uh, uh, is, is right. very, very aware that this could cost an election. Uh, how is the Kavanaugh vote? What, what does she hear about the Kavanaugh vote on the campaign trail? Well, I think she's hearing, obviously, and, and we're hearing this from going around and talking to voters, too, um, as we in a lot of other places in the country. There are clearly a lot of women uh, who admire uh, that who, who agree with her for in voting no, um, who think that she was that her main political virtue in this state uh, is not really that she's she's someone who's with Trump about half the time, against Trump about half the time. What people who admire her admire her for is her political independence. And there are a lot of people here whose attitude is that politics has gotten way too tribal in America. This is a conservative state, but it's a state that, as you will recall, not that long ago, put people like uh, Byron Dorgan and Ken Conrad in the U.S. Senate, Democrats of a certain kind of independent centrist stripe. They like that about Heidi Heitkamp, and I think there are a fair number of voters who look at her vote on Kavanaugh and say, you know, they understand that it was a vote of, of courage, a vote where she was voting against the, the easy politics of the moment and what the polls told her to do. So she gets credit for it in some quarters. But you also run into a lot of conservative voters in this state. It is a very red state. She's the only Democrat statewide here, the state Senate, the state legislature, the governor, the other senator, all Republicans, and not a little bit Republican, very Republican. That there are a lot of voters here, and especially a lot of men who we run into, who think, you know, that it was really disgusting that she voted against Kavanaugh uh, and that Kavanaugh got railroaded uh, and that they very much hold it against her. Now, they probably weren't really considering voting for her in the first place, but you hear a lot of that on the street, too. Uh, she is not backing away uh, from the 
sexual assault issues raised by the Kavanaugh uh, hearing. Let's take a look at the new ad that the uh, Heidkamp campaign is running, and this is an, an ad that's emerged after uh, this controversy with the print ad. Let's look at this. Yeah. When he dismissed sexual assault. There was no type of intercourse or anything like that. Nothing happened in terms of a sexual um, event beyond, obviously, the, the attack. You know, you, so you, there's a hypersensitivity. We shouldn't be surprised when women are abused. When someone disagreed with him, Kevin Kramer said he wanted to, quote, wring their neck and slam them against the wall. And so, John, uh, the Heidkamp campaign is not pulling away from that issue. No, and I think, Lawrence, it goes back to the thing we talked about, probably for both of us. I told her this when we talked last night. I said, I don't know that I've seen many tougher votes than the vote she took. And she took it. She, she was the attorney general in the state for, a dec for, for two terms. She's prosecuted a lot of sexual assault cases. Her mother was a victim of sexual assault and harassment. The, uh, and this is something that came out in the wake of that Kramer comment about women playing victim. She revealed that her mother was a victim. So she made her choice on this vote, and I think she recognizes that that's the, the hand she's playing, and if she's going to play that hand and, and maybe die on that hill, she's not going to go down without fighting this issue all the way out. John Hellman, thank you for joining us from North Dakota tonight. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Lawrence. Coming up, Donald Trump won Pennsylvania by one percentage point, but the Trump Republican Senate candidate is now down by 15 points. Donald Trump won the swing state of Pennsylvania by one percentage point. He has no margin of error there, and he has campaigned heavily for Pennsylvania Republicans. Here he is with the Republican candidate for Senate in Pennsylvania. We need Republicans. We need Lou Barletta. He is tough. We need Lou Barletta. We do. He's tough. If they're liking you, Lou, they're liking you. Tonight, Lou Barletta, Donald Trump's candidate for Senate in Pennsylvania is trailing Democratic incumbent Bob Casey by 15 points. Republicans are now in danger of losing five House seats in Pennsylvania. And the Republican candidate for governor in Pennsylvania is trailing the Democratic incumbent by 22 points. One of the reasons Donald Trump is of no value to Republicans running in Pennsylvania now is that Donald Trump, from the first day of his presidency, has done absolutely nothing to appeal to any voter who has not already voted for Donald Trump. President Trump's job approval rating has been holding in and around a stable 43%. Ben Bradley Jr. has been studying the vote in Pennsylvania and talking to voters about how Donald Trump won the state. He'll join us next as we consider why Donald Trump can't seem, cannot seem to help Pennsylvania Republicans now. Joining us now, Ben Bradley Jr., the author of The Forgotten, How the People of One Pennsylvania County Elected Donald Trump and Changed America. Uh, ben, when you look at uh, the way the Republicans are running in Pennsylvania now, trailing Democrats, possibly losing uh, five Republican House seats, if the base in Pennsylvania is sticking with Donald Trump, if they're still sticking with him, why can't he transfer that support to other Republican candidates? Well, you spotlighted uh, Lou Barletta. He's one of the people I profiled in my uh, book. And he was uh, Donald Trump, really, before Donald Trump. Uh, he focused on illegal immigration as an issue and uh, took it national, really. Um, and uh, he was one of the first to endorse Trump. The question will be whether Trump's coattails are long enough to uh, pull him over uh, in the Senate race against Bob Casey. Uh, it looks like they're not at the moment. And when you when you talk to Trump voters and, and for your book, it, it, it's I guess it's several months ago that you last were able to check in with them for the book. Uh, it, of the twelve in kind of your focus group, uh, only one Trump voter was in doubt about Donald Trump at this point. Right. Well, I, I checked in with them uh, much more recently, e even after the book closed. I've been in touch with them informally, and that. That number still holds. Of the, of the 12 I profiled, 11 say that if the election were to be held, uh, the 2020 election were to be held tomorrow, they would enthusiastically vote for Trump. 
uh, only one has slipped into the undecided, as you mentioned. So I, I guess the, the question becomes, both for the midterms and uh, 2020, is what, what is the ceiling on Trump's base? Yeah, if, is it a ceiling? And then if he were to lose, say, one in 12 uh, in Pennsylvania, then he would lose the state. I mean, that, that's, uh, he doesn't have that kind of margin there uh, on his uh, 2016 win. No, he doesn't. Um, he, he only won the state by uh, 44,000 votes. And the county that I focused on, Luzerne County, supplied uh, 26,000 of those votes, uh, or 60 percent. So without this county, Luzerne, he wouldn't have won uh, the state of Pennsylvania, or perhaps the presidency, to the extent Pennsylvania's demographics are similar to the two other key swing states, Michigan and Wisconsin. And Ben, that county, as you report, had been voting Democratic uh, for several previous presidential elections. They hadn't voted uh, for a Republican since 1988, uh, Bush Sr., and uh, they'd voted for Obama twice. Uh, but they, it surged for Trump, and he won it by 20 points. You had all these Democrats crossing over into uh, and to, to vote in the Republican primary for Trump. And, of course, they stayed with him uh, for the general. They, they said that the, uh, they felt that the Democratic Party had left them, rather than them leaving uh, the Democratic Party. And when we look at the, uh, at the midterm election results coming in from Pennsylvania, what will you be looking for? Well, uh, Barletta will certainly be one, one uh, barometer, um, but it, 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 it will be a referendum on Trump. And the question is, uh, after the uh, redistricting in Pennsylvania, how many House seats uh, will the Democrats pick up? It looks like at least four. Uh, I'll be looking at those things. Ben Bradley, Jr., the book is entitled The Forgotten. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thanks. And tonight's last word is next. Stephen Colbert is at CBS, where, of course, 60 Minutes is done. And so Stephen Colbert's dream has come true for tonight's last word. Stephen Colbert gets to be a 60 Minutes correspondent. You've been president for two years. There's something really terrible and disgusting about that. No, I agree. <laughs> How would you sum up your administration so far? It is vicious. It's full of lies, deceit, and deception. Speaking of which, if you get rid of Jeff Sessions, who would you replace him with? Pillows and blankets. <laughs> Stephen Colbert gets tonight's last word. Uh, this weekend, MSNBC is going to Los Angeles for Politicon. NBC News and MSNBC will host films and panels with many of MSNBC's hosts and reporters who cover politics. If you're in the area, join us at the Los Angeles Convention Center or go to politicon.com to find out more. Hey, it's Chris Hayes from MSNBC. You know, every day I come to the office and we make a television show. And every day I think to myself, there's so much more I want to talk about. And so this is our podcast. It's called Why Is This Happening? And the whole idea behind it is to get to the root of the things that we see play out every day. They're driven by big ideas. Each week, I sit down with a person uniquely suited to explain why this is happening. New episodes of Why Is This Happening every Tuesday. Listen for free wherever you get your podcasts.